I'm Jake. I'm, uh, I'm head of Quay at CoreOS. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you about containers and microservices and some of the new ways that you can actually manage these things. My goal is that you leave here with some kind of non-trivial realization. Um, so a lot of times we go to talks and we just listen to the same stuff over and over again. Um, I'm sorry if it ends up being that, but hopefully everyone here will, will ha leave with a, a new realization or some new insight. Um, all right, so this is me. Um, I worked for about seven years at all of the, the big co's that you see listed there. Um, from Boeing, where I worked on flight simulator software. Amazon, I worked on e-commerce platform stuff. And then Google, where I worked on APIs. Um, after that, my buddy and I left Google to found a startup. Uh, and then we spent about two years on that. Uh, interesting uh, tidbit, we actually used Docker and Prod since version 0.3. Um, those were the scary days where every new release of Docker brought something completely new. Um, we built Quay out of necessity. So Quay is the product that I continue to run at CoreOS. Um, and Quay is a container image registry. So it's the place that you store your uh, immutable deployable artifacts before you send them out to your servers. Um, as I alluded to, we were acquired by CoreOS and I continue to work on the same software. Um, so all in all, I have about 11 years of experience in kind of these distributed systems. Um, if you don't know what CoreOS does, um, we, our tagline is that we're running the world's containers. You may have also heard that we're securing the back end of the internet. Um, both of those things are true. Uh, we're, we have deeply ingrained open, or we're a deeply ingrained open source company. So we have uh, over 90 projects with over 1,000 different contributors. Um, those aren't all Coreos. Uh, that's what we call ourselves. Um, and we also have some enterprise solutions where we, we bundle these things together or we provide a service that, that enables this way of thinking. Um, so that's the Tectonic and Quay products, which I'll get to in a second. So how many of you here have heard the term Giphy? Um, it's no surprise what it stands for, because I put it right there. Um, it's Google's infrastructure for everyone else. Uh, this is kind of a charged term. Um, there's a little bit of FUD. It's like, oh, if, if you're not doing what Google's doing, then like, are you doing it okay enough? Um, and when I sat down and I thought about it, it turns out that what Giphy actually is isn't really defined anywhere. Um, so I kind of wrote down what I think the core tenets of Google's infrastructure are in a way that they're shareable and they're understandable by other people. Um, and so when I sat down, these are the things that I came up with. Um, so first of all, we have cattle, not pets. Uh, that's probably pretty familiar to everybody by now, but basically the idea is that you don't put any special emphasis on one machine. Under Giphy, we also extend this to be any instance of a service, any instance of a database. Uh, basically, we want anything to be, be able to disappear immediately, be that due to failure, network partition, whatever, and have our infrastructure continue to run. Um, we also want declarative deployment. Declarative deployment means that you are basically telling the infrastructure what you want to run and not how to run it. We want automated scheduling. Uh, when we talk about uh, running things at Google scale, it's just impossible for a human to manually go and, and push uh, individual services to individual instances. We need service discovery. So if we are automatically scheduling these things, we don't really know where they're running and we don't really know how to contact them. Um, we also need some shared services on our cluster. Uh, and I'll get to this a little bit more later because that's a kind of interesting notion, but the idea that we can have services such as like log aggregation that are on cluster and that all of our services can depend on and address is kind of interesting. Um, finally, we need an incredible network to run all this stuff on. Um, so we can't just uh, decompose our apps into microservices and containers and expect to run it on the same network that was running monolithic apps. Um, that'll become more apparent later. And finally, Google has these incredible storage primitives that you can use to build your apps. So these are things like the Colossus file system or uh, the Spanner uh, immediately consistent distributed database. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how, I guess, your journey to Giphy works, the, the evolution of bringing Giphy to your infrastructure. So first we're going to start with a lowly web server. Right? It's just a simple Nginx web server uh, fronting an app built on Rails. A user makes a request, goes through the web server, goes through our app code. Um, let's say that this is an identity provider service. So uh, the only thing that we're doing is storing and retrieving users. Uh, and that's all built on top of Ruby on Rails, and it talks to a database. 
Okay, simple enough. We also run an API server in the same stack because it's convenient. So when we, when we run things together due to convenience, this is what I'm talking about with the monolithic architecture and uh, you know, the, lowly, the lowly monolithic web node. This is actually a really great way to architect your software when you're first bootstrapping, right? So if you've ever heard like Paul Graham say, do things that don't scale, um, this is probably one of them. But it has a lot of great features that software developers love, right? So it's easy to write these things. Uh, it's quick to deploy them. You just use the deployment mechanism for whatever your platform of choice is. You can fit the whole model completely in your head, right? It, it's not unreasonable that one developer might understand every single line of code that's, that's contributing to this application. And finally, if you just throw it behind a load balancer, you can actually scale it relatively well. Uh, and when you, when you start architecting your app in this monolithic fashion, right, you do the hello world for Rails, and you say, wow, this software stuff is easy. I don't know what's wrong with all these other, these other software architects. Like, you know, this, this is just easy stuff. Why is it so hard? So right, like I mentioned, um, when we start to get popular, we can take that same exact monolithic uh, app server, and we can just throw it behind a load balancer. Right, so in this case, we have uh, a bunch of app servers, and they're all talking to one database. We throw them behind a load balancer, and that fronts all of the traffic. But things get a little bit more interesting when we start getting popular, right? So what if our API traffic vastly outnumbers our, our actual user traffic, our rendering of web pages? Um, we're still deploying that web page rendering software to all of our servers, and that's taking up resources, it's taking up memory, I don't know if it has background processes, it might even be taking up CPU, um, but this is really unnecessary. So now we've deployed several copies of the app software to our, to our servers and we're not actually using them. So this is, these are wasted resources, right? These are, this is something that we'd wanna recapture. And this is one of the first things that people realize when they start talking about microservices, is that you can actually scale these things independently. Um, they also provide a lot of great other features, right? Like you can logically isolate your different portions of your app from one another, and that'll give you a uh, choice of technology. So each portion of the app can be built in, in whatever language and whatever server you want. Uh, and we can actually also get better machine utilization. And this is actually somewhat different from independently scalable, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, so the first thing we do to see what this looks like is we actually decompose our monolithic app into three services, right? We have a web service, which is fronting web page requests, which is fronting user traffic. We have an API service, which is talking to those machines. Uh, those are the ones that recently got popular. And we also have the users service, which is basically just loading and storing users for all of these other things. Um, and that's the only thing that talks to the database. And that can actually be really important because it gives us logical isolation. Like let's say we decided that you know, a relational database just isn't working out for us for some reason. Uh, the developers decide that they want to switch the database for a different store. Here I have the logo for etcd, um, which is something that we build. But the interesting thing is that due to um, decomposing this app into separate services, we actually get logical isolation. So the impact of that change of data stores stops at the individual service, right? So we can swap out the data store and none of the callers are any the wiser. It also lets us pick a variety of different technologies. So we could have somebody say, wow, I could really optimize the API server if I built it in Go. Uh, just because Go is fantastic for that kind of stuff. Uh, I mean, this is the developer talking. And then the, the web developer says, I'm sick of Rails. You know, Rails is terrible. I'm going to switch to Django. And all of that is feasible because we've decomposed our technology into these individual services. So this should be pretty much review at this point. Um, and then as I, I mentioned earlier, they're all independently scalable. So as the API service heats up, right, let's say somebody took our identity provider and they built the next Facebook out of it. They don't actually care about our website at all, but they're using our identity APIs very frequently. We can actually sp scale that service independently of the other services to reclaim some of those wasted resources. And I also mentioned better hardware utilization independent of independent scaling. And so that's the ability to specialize the hardware for the given task that we're trying to scale out. So rendering a web page may be more CPU intensive than serving a JSON API. So we can run those on bigger machines. And it turns out we actually want to do a lot of in-memory caching for a user service. So we run those on uh, a memory optimized version 
Uh, this is just, this is completely a fabricated example, but this is just showing how you can pick the hardware that will be best utilized. So if we picked um, memory and memory optimized hosts for everything, then our API servers would probably be wasting a lot of memory. But once we make this decision to decompose into microservices, we're left with a new set of challenges. Um, so when we decide that we want to build things, when we decide that we want to embark on a service-oriented architecture, having really strong interfaces is really the hallmark of a service-oriented architecture. Um, one thing that people often overlook is the fact that when these services are calling into each other, you actually need a much better network than you do before you had uh, service-oriented architecture. And we talked about how machine specialization actually lets us utilize, uh, use less resources, but machine specialization is also another thing that we have to pick. It's another part of the cognitive overhead of what we have to keep track of and what we have to decide. Uh, additionally, the ops team has a bunch of new work, right? So the ops team now has to figure out how to get logs off of all, out of all these services. They have to figure out how to health check all of these things independently. Um, and additionally, they have to figure out what happens if one of the services goes down, but not the entire thing. They have to figure out how to deploy these things. Um, and so there's as many ways to deploy software as there are software stacks. So that can be a real challenge for the ops team. Uh, and finally, like all of these things need to be able to talk to one another. And so there's a, a lot of networking overhead and making sure that everything that needs to talk to one another is actually routable. So let's talk about some of these things uh, independently. So the first thing we have is we have these strongly defined network interfaces. So in this example, I've decided that these gold bars are going to represent a, a network interface between services. So we take our user's service that we decomposed, which is the one that's responsible for talking to the data store, remember, and we've actually formally defined how that thing looks. Um, the choice of interface technology is kind of unimportant. So you could use a plain old REST server, you could use a Swift service, you could use gRPC, um, which is the new hotness from Google based on Proto3, um, if anybody has heard of that or used it. Um, but that's really, it's really unimportant. So the idea is to uh, formally specify these interfaces in a way that other people can consume them independent of what the, their interfaces are actually implemented using. Additionally, each one of these calls represents more network traffic that we didn't have before. So before the request came into our monolithic stack, it basically stayed in the stack until we decided how we wanted to go to the database and fetch the data. Uh, now we're actually um, generating more network traffic in between these services. And there's always the, also the idea that when you deploy these things, for example, in an auto-scaling group, are your services going to be one-to-one -one with the machines that they're running on? And often the answer is yes, right? That's the really trivial way to deploy using an auto-scaling group. So as I mentioned earlier, we picked a memory, uh, a memory intensive host for our user service, a CPU host for our, our web service, and a uh, really kind of weak host for our API. Um, but this idea that we sort of have to manage all these things and we have to tailor the, our use case, our use of machines to the different use cases is another piece of overhead. And we're left with a bunch of unanswered questions, right? So who's gonna run these things? You know, when are they gonna run them? Like, how, what are they even running, right? How do they get the things started? Why are they running them? And where are they going to run them, right? So. Often we'll just say spin up a new cluster, deploy it everywhere, um, but that's probably not the best answer. At least we know who, right? So we know who's going to be running them. The ops team is obviously responsible for all the stuff, as, as always. And the answer of when we're gonna run it is always now, right? Management never says, ah, you've got that awesome new software, just let it chill for a little while. So we're always gonna be running this stuff. Um, so two of the answers are really, really trivial, but the other ones require a little bit more in-depth analysis. So I talked about the ops overhead of deploying things. So if we go back to our example stack, we're using uh, Django, we're using Golang. Uh, in a previous example, we were using Rails for our user service. So I just took a brand new Ubuntu install and I said, how much software does it actually add to make this image capable of running Rails, Django, uh, a Golang-based app, and running it all behind Nginx? So I ran this and then I diffed the number of packages that were actually installed on the server. So it actually installed something like 147 new 
uniquely versioned packages. And these are things that the ops team has to understand and the ops team has to account for. So each one of these new packages is something that may introduce security vulnerabilities. Each of these packages is something that has to be uh, independently versioned and that have to remain compatible across all the different versions of software. I also mentioned that the ops team has to know how to get your code on the box. Um, there are a variety of ways of getting software on a box, right? And if each team picks a different one, it makes it really awful for the ops team. Again, there are as many ways to run a server as there are to get it on a box. So the ops team now has to have uh, specialization, understanding of how to run the things that they've even gotten on the box. And so these all become sort of informal contracts between uh, the operations team and the people developing the software. And the question of adding a new piece of infrastructure, adding a new server type, adding a new language, actually becomes physically manifested as burden for the ops team. But it's 2016 now, and we've had easy to use lightweight containers since at least 2013. So a lot of people have a lot of ideas about what containers actually are. At their core, they're literally just an isolation mechanism. They're a way of saying, the, these things should be run in a way that's uh, isolated from other things that are run in a similar fashion. We often use them for normalization as well. So usually they're only sharing the Linux kernel and everything else is brought in. Um, and finally, they're just a building block to having this like next-gen infrastructure, this Google's infrastructure for, everything else, for everyone else. So Google has been running on containers for you know, a decade plus by this point, and the rest of us are just finally catching up. Containers also usually bring a few extra assumptions. So usually the container runtime that you pick will also prescribe an image format. Um, this image format is usually immutable, so it's something that you build ahead of time and that you deploy as a single unit. And they are often, they often have you bundle your dependencies. So bundling your dependencies mean that all of those things that the ops team had to install to prepare a server for your software now come with the container image. They often also prescribe a distribution mechanism. So this is the, the rocket fetch or the docker pull, um, depending on which runtime you're using. They often say how to run the things. So they provide runtime metadata saying like, this is the, this is the binary entry point for this container. Um, and these are the args that you have to pass to get this thing fully running. Or these are the environment variables. Um, they're usually lightweight. So not all implementations of containers are lightweight. And they're often co-schedulable as well. And that's actually one of the most important things that we're going to talk about going forward. So Rocket is a container runtime from CoreOS. It uh, has a little bit different um, guarantees and a little bit different uh, priorities than Docker. I'd be happy to answer questions about it at the end of the talk if we have time. And Quay, as I mentioned, is the team that I run. It's a, uh, it's a distribution mechanism. It's a repository for your your container images. You can think of it as GitHub is to your code, Quay is to your compiled container images. And we support both Docker and Rocket. But while we're talking about what containers are, we should probably also talk about what they're not. Right? So containers are not usually fully isolated. So there's some kind, there's often some level of uh, there's often some level of cooperation when we co-schedule containers onto a box. We really can't say that these things are fully isolated against a, a hostile client. Um, an example of where this manifests itself is prior to the inclusion of user namespaces and all the container runtimes, um, all of your user process limits were shared across users of those same ID number across all containers running on a given host. Um, they're also not as secure as VMs. So if you've built your infrastructure up based on virtual machines, um, they're not a drop-in replacement. You can't run a, a hostile workload. You can't run something that's actively trying to escape the container. Um, there, there are demonstrated container escapes if you run things as root inside the container. And there are rumors of container escapes if you run things not as root inside the container. Um, so these are things that you want to be aware of when you're picking a solution or when you're deploying your, your first containerized infrastructure. And they're also not a panacea, right? So as much as container vendors would like you to believe if you adopt containers, all your problems go away, that's not entirely true. But what they, where they really help is saving the ops team from this incredible burden 
of having to prepare a server for your software, figure out how to run your software, and uh, you know, get the software on the box. So a container image we can think of as our app code, our dependencies, and a manifest which tells the container runtime how to run that thing, all bundled together as a single, single deployable artifact. Um, and as I mentioned before, the manifest might have information such as this is the entry point, these are the required uh, environment variables, these are the ports that I'm, I'm planning to expose, uh, this is the data that I require. Um, and we combine all of those things together, we get something that's easily deployable, right? So before we had all of those, rsync, SSH, SCP, you know, uh, Puppet and Chef, Bundle Install, PIP, all of those strategies, those are now just one deployment strategy, right? We're literally telling the runtime, hey, go out and fetch that deployable artifact and get it on the machine, right? And when it comes time to run it, because we have that rich set of metadata, running it becomes easy too. So running it is just saying, here's your host, you know, you, we've got the software on the host, go forth and make the container run. Uh, and hopefully the, the person who built the container image has put enough information in there that that's uh, a single click, that's a single operation. So now with the containers, this, this base layer, we've answered a few more of our questions, right? So we take our microservice images and we build them into a container image. Um, easy, right? Now we know what to run. And we also know how to run it because the container is self-describing. It says, this is the way that I want, this is the way I want to run, right? If, if you follow the way that I've decided I need to run, then I'll work. That, that's my guarantee to you. That's the, the promise. But we still have a few more questions to answer. So, like, why do we run a container? Um, the trivial answer is because someone said Docker run or rocket run, right? But that's, you know, that's not really a why, that's more of a how. Um, so some of the reasons we might decide that we need to run additional instances of a container is because we may run out of capacity. Um, maybe the host that the container was running on before died and, and went away, or maybe there's a network partition. Um, maybe we're launching something completely new, right? This is a new service, we're entering a new space. Uh, the developers have decided that they need a new component in order to, to bring their app to reality. Or maybe we have high availability requirements, right? Maybe one instance of a container is enough to serve all of our traffic, but if we lose that one instance, we don't want our service to go down. And finally, we may not have a reason to exist in isolation, but like our user service before, other things are depending on us. So that, that's another reason that we might actually want to run one of these services. And then of course there's the where, right? And so where I think is actually the most interesting question uh, that we can answer today. So there are a variety of goals that we're trying to satisfy when we pick where to run something. Um, we may want to better utilize the hardware that we've been allocated. We may want to better utilize uh, the different types of boxes. So maybe we've been given a whole bunch of memory, uh, memory specialized boxes, but we don't really use a whole lot of memory, so maybe we can load more things into that box. We also want to isolate failure domains. So this is one of the things that I think a lot of people kind of know, but haven't really internalized yet. Um, so that's, that's the thing that we're, we're trying to accomplish. And also, we need to be close to things. So even, even if we've isolated all of our failure domains and we're utilizing the hardware to our, our best of our ability, there's always going to be speed of light problems, right? So if you're too far from your data, it's going to lead to a terrible user experience. Um, if you're too far from your dependencies, it's not going to work out great. And finally, if all of this stuff works great at the border of your, uh, your, of your data center, but the user themselves are off in Australia somewhere and your data center's here in the US, um, that's not really going to lead to a great user experience either. Let's talk about hardware utilization. Um, so this is just a, a virtual box. Um, it, it has four units of memory, whatever that means, call them gigabytes or RAM sticks or whatever, and it has four units of CPU. We can think of that as quarters of a CPU. Um, and we've got a service like Redis. So Redis is an in-memory data store, um, but it's very efficiently written. So let's say Redis takes up a lot of memory, um, but not a whole lot of CPU, 
And then we've also got a service that's running a, a VPN gateway. Um, VPN is doing a lot of crypto. Crypto is very expensive CP in CPU terms, but really it's not keeping track of a lot of data. Everything's very streaming. Everything's very efficient from a memory perspective. Who thinks they know where I'm going with this? Okay. Everybody's asleep after lunch, I guess. Ta-da! We fully utilized our box uh, in the most efficient way possible. And this kind of uh, bin packing um, choices that we can make when we're scheduling things can really get us higher into the utilization um, threshold than what we're used to. So traditionally when we plan for capacity, we plan to use like 40 to 50% of a box. Um, if we have this kind of intelligent scheduling uh, and we have isolated failure domains, which I'm going to talk about next, we can actually load these boxes up much heavier. Um, I think we run our boxes, we, we don't have them auto scale until they get to about 80% CPU. So we can run everything a lot hotter and of course that saves us money and everybody likes to save money. Um, at least if people don't like to save money, their bosses like when they save money. So we wanna do that. We also wanna isolate our failure domains, right? So in this case, by the way, whose architecture looks like this today? Where you have internal load balancers, everything's independently scaled. Um, it, it's actually a pretty solid architecture, so don't be embarrassed. I'm not gonna say like this is terrible. Okay, surprisingly few. Whose architecture looks like the monolithic behind a load balancer still? Okay, again, it works for uh, a lot of use cases. It's remarkably resilient. Um, but anyway, the thing that I wanna talk about is the failure domain or the impact of losing one box. So in this case, each one of these logical boxes um, that represent a service are literally one physical box or one EC2 virtual machine, for example. If I lose just a single web box, I've lost 50% of my capacity to serve web traffic. Maybe that's fine, right? Maybe we've over-provisioned by 50% and now the other box is just struggling to keep up running at 100%. Um, but it's really not great. So what we can do is through intelligent scheduling decisions, we can actually break these things down into smaller chunks and we can amortize the failure. So we took our two web services and we, we made them smaller, right? And we spread them out over four boxes. So maybe each one is only capable of serving half as much traffic as the old one, but in aggregate, they still have the same capacity. Um, our API service was already lean and small, so we just threw one of those everywhere um, that we felt like it. And our user service is still heavyweight, but we found out that by running our, our servers um, hotter, run, by running our servers closer to capacity, we're actually able to fit more user services on, on a fewer number of hosts. And now what we've essentially done is we've reduced the total number of loss to our, of our architecture to a smaller fraction of each service. So now when we lose one box, instead of losing 50% of our web, uh, uh, capability, we actually only lose 25% of our web capability and 20% of our API capacity. Um, this is really easy to design around, right? So if you run on 100 servers, the, the single box loss is going to be approximately 1%. Uh, and, th and this is a, a really great kind of benefit of letting these things um, be scheduled for you. Of course, there's not just like, a single box is not the only failure domain we have to worry about, right? So we can also lose a whole rack, right? The router on the top of a rack can die. Um, maybe a, a couple of racks are sharing a power supply and that power supply overheats. Maybe we lose an entire data center, right? These are like the kind of cataclysmic level events or, or more often a network partition. Um, and for political reasons, sometimes we've even lost an entire country, right? So an entire country closes its internet borders and any of your traffic that was being handled in that country is gone. Um, this is a, obviously a non-comprehensive list of failure domains, but these are some of the things that you can think about when you think about what does a perfectly scheduled set of services when it comes to my use cases actually look like. But when we start thinking about scheduling at the rack layer, at the cluster layer, at the data center layer, it actually turns into a problem that's pretty intractable to humans. So in a single rack, yeah, I could probably pick where these, these three services run and how often. At the cluster layer, oh, um, well, that's a little bit harder. Now I'm a, I'm a human making you know, hundreds of decisions and if one of these things goes down, I'm, I'm manually picking where to reroute them, that's not great. 
and I, I can have several clusters within a data center, and that, I mean, that makes the problem you know, exponentially harder. Every time you abstract to a higher level, the problem gets harder for humans. Um, when I was building this slide, I noticed that this starts to look a little bit familiar. Um, any of you guys have ever seen a, a CPU die map of what a, a CPU looks like? Uh, just like this very large scale integration problem, this is something that humans really can't do without help. So in order to make this problem more tractable, we actually build higher level abstractions, right? We build tooling to help us. So we, we build things that do these things for us. And finally, we build automation, right? So computers are way better at tracking millions of details than any human ever could be. So the first higher level abstraction I wanna talk about is the pod, if you're familiar with Kubernetes parlance or sidecar. Um, if you've heard about some other uh, container solutions. So what these things do, um, they allow you to decompose your service even farther into um, helper containers. So you may have your app code, which you're very familiar with, but you may also have an ops team that ships a, a log shipper container. And a log shipper container is something that sits next to your app and takes the burden of making sure that your logs get somewhere useful in case this thing fails. You also might have proxies, and the proxies may be doing auth, the proxies may be doing load balancing. Um, you can have middleware, so middleware may make intelligent decisions about caching, um, for example. And one of the interesting things is that usually these things share a network namespace. So that means that if these things are getting co-scheduled on a box, they can actually rely on being able to find each other at like localhost colon some port. Uh, and th this is actually a, a critical portion of making these things easy to compose and these things easy to, um, to deploy. So just a simple example, I talked about the log shipper sidecar and I talked about how aggregating logs is a, a problem for the ops team when we decompose into microservices. So I've taken my original three service architecture and I've decided that everywhere that I run one of my services, I'm also gonna run a sidecar or I'm gonna run these things in a pod. And that pod is going to have a container which can send my logs off to somewhere, somewhere off box, somewhere reliable, right? Because we wanna decouple ourselves from a single box failure domain. Um, in this case, I decided I wanna run the ELK stack. Uh, a lot of people are probably familiar with that, but it's basically just um, logly decoupled into open source services or you know, Google's log infrastructure decomposed into open source services. Um, and that thing has its own database. It's keeping data in its own off-box area, and it's just another network service, right? So I've, I've taken the problem of aggregating logs. I've solved it once for all of my containers. Um, the interface between the, the individual containers and the sidecar services is just the network. So this is something that I'm already familiar with. And then those things themselves are talking to another well-defined service. So it, it really becomes this, this composable set of components um, even below the service layer. Another thing that I alluded to in what actually makes uh, this Giphy infrastructure is the ability to deploy things declaratively. Uh, and when I say declaratively, instead of saying, hey server, go run this software, I'm saying, hey infrastructure, I want this software to be running. And if the software isn't running, the infrastructure has to go and do whatever is necessary to make that run. Um, and in this way, I'm actually describing my app. I, I just threw an example, um, Kubernetes pod manifest on the right, but it's basically just saying, or replication manifest, it's basically just saying, I want two Nginxes running somewhere. Um, and you, uh, th they come from this container image, and when I run them, I want them to be called Nginx, right? Uh, and it's really just a way of, of abstracting ourselves from the nitty gritty of how things are being accomplished and moving up to the layer of saying what we want to be accomplished. And this is actually how we answer the question why, right? Because we're answering the question why as in I've described the infrastructure to look like this, right? And now you, the, the infrastructure um, manager software, need to make the decision of how you satisfy that description. Um, so I guess we've kind of been building up to this for quite a while, but you kind of need this whole cluster scheduling mechanism that sits on top of all your hardware and makes these decisions for you. Right? Um, so Kubernetes is one particular flavor of cluster managing software. There's also Mesos. Um, Google uses a piece of software called Borg internally. 
Um, that's, you know, these are basically just one API that you can talk to when you want to push descriptions onto your cluster. Um, the scheduler itself is responsible for deciding uh, what services are actually running and where they're running. Um, and it does this by satisfying constraints that you've defined ahead of time. So you might say like, I don't want these things to run next to each other, or I do want these things to run next to each other, or these things should be in a different rack. And really, you want to have these primitives uh, exposed to you to be able to define these constraints and how things are, are scheduled. Um, Kubernetes is an open source project originally started by Google. Um, it's now been donated to a foundation, and we at CoreOS are upstream uh, contributors to Kubernetes. Um, and another important thing that I failed to mention is that the cluster scheduler software reacts to changes. So if something fails, uh, if something, if, if our hardware architecture changes, if we suddenly have more hosts or fewer hosts, uh, that, that scheduler is still responsible for making our description of what the world should look like, reality, regardless of what any of these types of failures or what any of these types of changes are. Um, and then that could also include, I as a developer say that instead of needing two of these things, I now need three. Um, and the way it accomplishes this is by just running a tight loop that says, you know, what am I currently running and what do I need to be running? And, and satisfying the constraints to fix that, uh, that delta of differences. And so we finally answered the question of where these things are gonna be running, right? So we actually just let the cluster scheduler pick for us. So now everything is running. Um, we've decided, you know, we, we've adequately set up our constraints to make sure that it runs in the right spot. Um, we've described what we want things to look like, so we're done, right? Um, seems like it, all of our services are running. Um, but one of the things that we actually haven't talked about is once the scheduler decides where these things are running, how do we find our dependencies? How do our external user-facing load balancers find the services that we're running? Um, so this is another abstraction that we, we build on top of all of these containers running on various hosts called service discovery. So now whenever the scheduler makes a publishing decision, the scheduler also turns around and informs somebody else of the decision that it made. Um, in the Kubernetes case, the default is to have it stored in etcd and to have all of that information surfaced through all of the traditional DNS tools that you're familiar with um, using a service called SkyDNS. All of this is pluggable. You can replace it with whatever you want. Um, SkyDNS itself is also an open source service. Um, and I just find it interesting that they literally call themselves Skynet, which is kind of a, a pretty, charged terms, pretty charged term when we come to letting the machines take the, take the power away from us. Um, but when we put it all together, we actually have our, our existing constructs for resolving things like get host by name, those continue to work. So now we can say get host by name, find me an API server, and it'll actually return an IP address. Now that we've got that IP address though, we still may have a challenge of being able to access that IP address from where we happen to be scheduled in the cluster. So another higher level abstraction that we've built is called an overlay network. Um, the goals of an overlay network, I, I don't wanna dwell too much on what an overlay network actually is, but the goals and the problem that it solves are letting containers find each other easily. Um, every time we make a scheduling decision to create one of those pods that we talked about earlier, and we said that those have a network namespace, we're also assigning that network namespace a unique IP per pod. Um, and this allows us to continue to use the, the standard networking, networking approaches that we've been using for decades, right? So our HTTP servers can still bind on port 80. They don't have to run on some high numbered port and then run a proxy to get to the right place. We, we're also aware of the actual IP address as it relates to other containers that we've been given, right? So if I bind to a particular IP address, I can turn around and tell people that I'm bound to that IP address and that's useful to them. Um, this is often not the case if we have several layers of routers or if we have any kind of network address translation in place. So the overlay network really gives us uh, a logical network that's uh, scheduling and container specific on top of whatever physical network that, we, that we're built on top of. And it also eliminates one of the fundamental constraints of 
standard Linux boxes, which is that we often are limited to one IP address per host. Um, this really isn't going to work if we want to have these co-scheduled things that can bind on whatever port that they want, whatever port that they've been pre-configured to. We really need to be able to have multiple IP addresses per host. And an overlay network helps us solve this problem. All right, let's see how we're doing. Um, so we have a better set of answers. Some of them have changed a little bit. Um, so the who is no longer the ops team, right? Now we're letting the cluster management software make all of our decisions for us. Of course, the ops team still has to run the cluster management software, but we've abstracted the problem one layer higher to make it more human friendly. Uh, the when is still the same. Uh, we pretty much always want to be running the things that we need to service our customers. Um, the what has changed a little bit. Instead of running an individual container, we are now describing a set of containers that need to be run together uh, in this pod or sidecar abstraction. The how is still the same, right? So these higher level uh, cluster scheduling abstractions still just run containers at the end of the day, right? And they co-schedule them onto boxes. So that hasn't changed. Um, the why is still the same from when we originally answered it, which is the user wants it to be so, uh, and so we make it so. And the where is wherever the scheduler decides is best, wherever it can satisfy your constraints about failure domain isolation, uh, number of running services, capacity, what type of box we need to be running on, etc. Now let's take a look at our scorecard for Giphy. Uh, what, did, what did we do right and what did we not quite get? So we, we've isolated all of our failure domains, which means that everything down to our services are now cattle, no longer pets. Um, we're doing declarative deployment, which is uh, much preferred to um, imperative deployment because it kind of puts all the failures into one common resolution mechanism, which is it's not running and it needs to be, so make it so. We've got automated scheduling, so Kubernetes is making decisions for us based on uh, what we've described needs to be running and what is actually running. We brought in a service discovery mechanism. Um, I talked about shared services on the cluster a little bit when I showed the, the log stash stack, but if you want to extrapolate from there, you could run uh, monitoring software in a centralized location. Uh, you could run uh, your metrics software in terms of like turning your monitors into useful dashboards. You could run um, data warehousing software where you push values into once a day and go back and get those things later. And those things uh, can be found at a known address based on the service discovery. Um, we have this software-defined network. Um, it's a really powerful network because we've you know, exponentially increased the amount of network traffic that we have in order to get uh, this isolation. So if you think about it, we've essentially made a network traffic failure domain trade-off. So we, we've, traded, uh, we've traded better failure response for more network traffic, um, which is kind of an interesting uh, fallout. But one thing that we didn't really talk about at all was storage. So when we're running these things on cluster, uh, we can't really store things within the container because those things are really ephemeral. We can't really store anything on a particular box um, because if that box goes away, we're right back to having the same kind of failure domain, the single box failure scenario as we had before. So I think storage is where you're gonna see a lot of innovation um, coming in over the next year or two as well as improvements to the scheduler. So a lot of the higher level abstractions about scheduling around a particular rack, um, those are things that are still kind of clunky to do with the, the cluster scheduler software we have today. Um, and storage is still kind of a, an open question. So your, continue, your current storage solutions will continue to work. So if you're using NFS, you can actually bind your NFS drives in the same way. Um, but it's not really this like cluster aware resilient type of storage that we're expecting. Um, you may be familiar with a project called Ceph. Ceph is kind of a software defined storage solution as well, but it's again not great at uh, running on cluster because it relies on um, being able to store persistent data to disk. We are seeing new cluster aware storage solutions come out. Um, so one of them is like uh, Cluster HQ has a solution which uses uh, ZFS snapshots to migrate your data around. and an interesting one for us, because it's built here in New York City and they're friends of ours, is CockroachDB. So they're attempting to bring the, the spanner style, immediately consistent um, database to cluster aware and do all the storage cluster aware while making it resilient, hence the name Cockroach. 
Um, finally, I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about what we sell at CoreOS. So we sell a, a vision, we sell a specific slice of all of these technologies uh, combined together into a stack that we call Tectonic. Um, everything on this slide except for the Quay project is open source. So we, even the things that we sell, we are truly committed to open source and we are truly making sure that uh, these technologies are available even if you don't wanna buy our supported version of it and that you, you can build this goodness up from the ground if you need. Um, I haven't mentioned Clara yet, but Clara is a vulnerability scanner that we have to isolate and identify those uh, vulnerabilities in all the packages that I listed earlier. When, when we start bundling dependencies, we've moved the problem from an ops problem to uh, a container image maker problem. Um, so Clara really helps with identifying and addressing those vulnerabilities. If you want to hear more about this type of new style infrastructure, um, we're having Cora West Fest in Berlin this year. It's just under a month away, um, but I believe there are still a few tickets available. If everybody wants a, a last minute trip to Berlin, um, highly recommended. And that's all I had. Thanks. Um, I hope. I hope there was at least one non-trivial realization in there. Um, I think the, the failure domain isolation is something that we're all kind of aware of, but nobody's really thinking about in concrete terms. So that, that was kind of one of the, the main takeaways that I hope uh, you guys had. Um, and unfortunately, we have about three minutes for questions. So I could probably take one or two. Anybody? Bueller? You want a t-shirt? Is, is that a question? Yeah? Um, if I understood the question correctly, it was, we can already get a lot of these same kind of abstractions by running virtual machines? Is that, is that right? No, I'm, I'm, saying, I'm saying that when you do programs, several programs, you have abstracted away from the operating system and the, and the hardware, and you have to run the JVM or the CLR. Oh, okay. Okay, so now that I understand the question better, it's this abstracts over a single data center. Are we a couple of years away from the JVM for the data center? Um, this is already something that Mesos is attempting to do with their DCOS. So they're trying to abstract a set of primitives instead of abstracting the, or they're trying to um, advertise a set of primitives that you, can, that you can kind of just program against the data center. Uh, so that, that, that's a project that's already attempting to accomplish that. What you lose with that is you lose the, the decades of uh, knowledge that we've built up about how to run servers and how to, how to do networking and how to bind ports. Um, so it, it, you really have to adopt the new paradigm pretty much 100%. Um, but yeah, we, we are abstracting over the data center. And there's actually, if you go into the Kubernetes GitHub repository, there's actually a project in there called Ubernetes which is abstracting data centers across the planet, right? So now I don't wanna stop saying like, how can, I, how can I schedule around one machine or one cluster loss in a data center? But I also need to start making decisions about how I can run these things in a geographically distributed manner uh, in the same declarative kind of fashion. So I might say something like, this needs to be run in three different places on earth. But oh, by the way, Bandwidth between data centers is very expensive, so I also want to avoid shipping data whenever possible. So th these are things that we're looking for. Um, I don't know if that answered your question, but I certainly tried. <laughs> uh, anything else? I think we're officially out of time, but okay. All right, thanks, guys. <laughs>